Welcome, everybody. I am here with a special guest today, exorcist priest Father Dan Rehill uh, from the Diocese of Nashville. Uh, it's my honor to, to have you here, Father Dan. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Father. It's good to be with you. It's an interesting trend, Father Dan. I noticed that in recent years, um, often when a Medjugorje visionary may have her or his apparition in public, uh, once in a while you may see a person demonically manifesting mm -hmm. when the apparition begins. And uh, now I believe that, that I know what's happening that moment, but I, I wanted to get your take on it. What's what's going on in that moment? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's not a science. That's the first thing people need to realize. I, I wish it was because it'd be easier for us, but it's not a science. It's, it's based on a, a lot of factors of who is present that we can see and who is present that we can't see. So I would say when Our Lady appears uh, in the presence of somebody who's carrying a demon in them, the demon gets very uncomfortable in her presence because she's so holy, she's so pure, she's so perfect in every way that they they can't stand being in her presence. And so they act up. Uh, I would say it's safe to say that for sure. Um, and for some people, you know, there's other, there are others who would just be, be compelled to walk away as it's happening because the demon is has control of, of the body. When someone's possessed, they control the body. So they'll just they'll leave. But other times you see them that they're just stuck there and they're screaming or writhing in pain or something. And, um, you know, it's best to just pray for them. Uh, you don't want to go over and start doing things to them. But I've had that happen even if just climbing the mountain where I'd see mm. you know, suddenly somebody starts screaming in that very demonic voice and you know, I, you don't know what triggers it, but it's generally speaking, it's like they don't like to be in the presence of holiness. Yeah, yeah, because I noticed um, we've had similar situations, for example, at uh, Stu Steubenville conferences or encounter ministry conferences, mm -hmm. the priest is processing with the demonstrants, with the Eucharist, mm -hmm. and you, you see that once in a while a manifestation can begin, and you just get the sense that the demon cannot stand it because of the gravity of the presence of the sacred in the moment that I presume gives, gives it spiritual pain in a way. Yeah, I was at a mass and uh, when I was a, a religious in, in Omaha, Nebraska, and the bishop came to celebrate mass for us. And I believe there was a deacon proclaiming the gospel, and the bishop was you know standing to the side. And we had several people who had demonic problems with us because they come for retreats to be to be liberated. So they're there as well. But you know, normally they're pretty under control until you go into a prayer session with them. But the gospel that day was from John the, saying the light um, has come into the world and the darkness cannot overcome it, which we use in exorcisms. That's actually part of the right. And when that was proclaimed, this demon went berserk and just is like screaming bloody murder and flailing around. And the Bishop was visibly scared. I mean, he was just like, what are we going to do? And so we, some of the guys just ushered that person out of the chapel and into a private room to, to work with them privately. But, you know, wow. that they know that scripture is in the rite of exorcism, so they don't like it. Mm -hmm. So when they just yeah. hear now, of course, nobody else kind of understood what was happening, but the priest kind of did. And the bishop was just completely f thrown for a loop. And he was, he was very happy to have that person escorted away. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I talk about the uh, the power of the word of God. Oh, yeah. yeah. Proclaimed spoken words. And uh, how, Father Dan, how have you experienced the power of Our Lady during exorcisms? Tremendous power. Tremendous power. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, Jesus doesn't really show up at an exorcism. I mean, I've never had Jesus show up per se, where I know, you know, Jesus, and we use his name throughout it, but Our Lady shows up often. In fact, the very first exorcism, the rite of exorcism I ever did, we went through the whole rite, and this poor woman was being tortured. I mean, you could just see she was sweating and rolling on the floor, and she was gasping for air, and, and her pastor was with me. And at the end of this thing, she was still not set free. And that, that frequently happens. where It takes several sessions to get them free. And I looked at him, and I said, should we keep going or do you want to schedule this a second appointment, you know, like next month? And he was, he was so 
traumatized by what she was going through. He said, no, we're not going to do this again. Keep going. This is going to happen today. We're not going to wait another month for this thing to leave. So we kept going. And then he had just ordered this enormous, like eight foot painting of Guadalupe that was in this like room that we were doing this in. And I just had a, this is a Spanish, a Mexican woman that's having this affliction. And I just turned to her and I said, turn to your mother and ask for her help. And I pointed to this, to the painting and she looked at it and she said in Spanish, no, please mother help me. And then she went like completely convulsing. And about two minutes after that, the thing left and she wow. was completely set free. So <laughs> I looked at the past. I go, had we known we could have started with that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, praise God, praise God. It's it's so interesting to me because I feel that those who know Our Lady intimately, they realize that she's not just this beautiful feminine presence, but yes, with that beautiful feminine presence, there's also a warrior queen. There's also the 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 queen who who with Saint Michael and Christ the King is in charge of the heavenly armies and yeah. does battle, does battle with the enemy. And also she's a mother. So think of the mama bear reflex mm. when one of the children is threatened, right? Um, yeah. And she's perfectly obedient. So when God gives her the authority to do these things, she knows this is in her purview. This is his desire that she would be there to do this. And of course, we believe that in the end, the final battle with evil will be her triumph that will, will, will defeat Satan. And that has mm. to be particularly humiliating for such a high powered demon that it's not God doing it. He's giving her the authority, which is, you know, for him, that would be the worst possible scenario. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And F Father Dan, what, um, what has been an example of perhaps um, some of the most extreme physical manifestations of evil that you've seen in an exorcism? Uh, well, I had somebody levitate off the couch and they were just floating in the air. That was, and that was just in a, that was in the first time I was meeting the person. I wasn't, there was no exorcism happening. I just started talking to him and then I said, let me pray a few prayers with you. When I did that, he went off the couch and I said, oh, oh, oh whoa, 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 we're not going to do this here because it was a halfway house. Wow. I said, I didn't realize you had this big a problem. We're going to have to schedule this at the church. And so then he had to come to the church. Um, the mo I've only been attacked once physically, and that was a another woman who was also she was on the floor, like kind of wiggling across the floor like a snake. Mm -hmm. And I'm just doing the prayers of exorcism, and then she looked up at me, and her eyes changed to snake eyes, like the yellow slanty eyes. And right away, I knew, oh, something's gonna ha something's happening here. Something bad is going to happen here. And she flew off the floor. She did not get up like on her hands and feet. She just flew right off the floor at me. She grabbed my stole and started choking me. And I looked to the, kind of my handler who's with me and he was terrified. He went like this, no, no. And I'm like, really? Th this is why you're here. And I just said, in the name of Jesus, stop. And she fell back on the floor mm -hmm. and let go of me. But that was, um, I mean, that was the first time and the only time that's ever happened where they went after me. Wow. Yeah, and to talk about the uh, the power of the name of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one one of the um one of the uh, interesting topics that I've heard uh, different opinions on from exorcists is um the topic of horror films. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've heard I've heard Father Gabriel Amor, Father Jose Antonio Fertua speak about the goodness of a film like The Exorcist. I, I have a friend who had a conversion experience after watching The Exorcism of Emily Rose. And on the other hand, I've, I've heard of an exorcist who advises against horror films, who, who says that they can attract demons. So I was curious, what, uh, what is your take on that topic? Uh, for me, it would depend on the film. And, and to, uh, to be honest, I don't like The Exorcist movie uh, because mm. Hollywood took tremendous liberties in making it their movie. It wasn't the actual story of the actual case. In the actual case, it was a little boy, not a little girl. Uh, both priests lived and survived. There was no death of a priest. So all those scenes where there was that, that, that desecration of the crucifix, that was all Hollywood added that in, that, because it was a boy. Um, and in the end, you know what happened in the real case was there was a statue of St. Michael in the room, and the priests saw the angel Michael come out of the statue and Michael himself delivered the little boy from the demon. 
So like, why isn't that a good enough story for Hollywood? <laughs> like, that's amazing. You would think they would leave that in, but they didn't. So I think it was just too much. And fear is, can be an open door to the demons. So when you have tremendous fear and, you know, that, that's a, it can be an access point for them. So that movie to me was particularly frightening. I, I saw it when I was a teenager, so it left a deep impact on me, but <laughs> didn't really like it. However, Nefarious is mm. a brilliant case study in actual possession. That's the most real I've ever seen a movie depict what actually happens with a possessed person. And so that is a great way to understand how the devil works. I was shocked it got made, to be honest. Yeah, you, you know, when I saw Nefarious, I was um, absolutely blown away by its theological precision. I mean, such deep theological insights about so many topics from the fall of the angels to uh, mm -hmm. the nature of evil. Mm -hmm. And you don't get a sense of them ever going astray into theological error, which which can be so easily accomplished in a Hollywood movie. So I was also very impressed with it. You know, I, I interviewed the producers of that movie and um, I did say, you know, my one question is, why did you make the priest have to be such a loser? Like mm. he was obviously not a strong Orthodox priest. And they, mm -hmm. they laughed. They said, if, cause if we used, if the priest was like you, then the movie would have been 12 minutes long. <laughs> so we, we needed sure. the priest to come and go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's yeah, and and it seems like uh, in using that priest, there, there there was a real message in terms of the demon already having an advantage because of the lack of orthodoxy in the priest and how yeah. that probably uh, makes them very spiritually vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I heard you uh speak, uh, Father Dan, a fascinating topic about AI and mm. something known as the. AI demon. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I, it was actually, I was reading, I think it was a New York times writer who did a story about, they were doing a story on the AI. And so he was conversing with the app, which is supposed to be just a machine. Right. And then he said to his son, his teenage boy, you know, you want to play with it. So the kid starts talking to it. And then the thing starts asking the boy questions about what he believes and it just kept getting, getting more and more personal. And then it was telling, I think it was telling the, the dad that, you know, his marriage wasn't great and it probably wasn't going to last. So it's just weird questions and answers were going on. And he finally just shut it down and said, that's not a machine. That's something else. And I think, you know, we know, the exorcists know that they work through technology all the time. I mean, poor Monsignor Rossetti, mm -hmm. they text him. He gets text messages from demons. Like, I don't have that. They, 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 uh, thank God I don't have that. I don't need that. But we know they can work through technology. So this is an ideal platform to impersonate a machine because how would you know? Yeah. People yeah. Think, and well, it's, it's just a really smart machine. Right. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, I've I've used uh, AI to make sacred arts. I've uh, I've played around with it. And, you know, sometimes you get beautiful sacred art uh, created by the computer but other times it comes out creepy other times there's strange stuff in there other times mm -hmm. it's like two virgin marys six fingers on a hand it's just a little odd it feels a little off and i know there's uh certain writers who are emphasizing is there a spiritual component there it could be something demonic there but but i, but I also understand that you probably want to find a good balance right be between spirituality and psychology not every situation will be demonic but certainly there are possibilities as you just mentioned in a new york times example yeah it's funny you mentioned the six the six fingers um because i was giving a teaching just yesterday about david and goliath mm -hmm. and you know goliath was this monster of a man uh but he and the whole, the whole point of this lesson was about why did david if david really believed god was with him why did he pick up five stones why did he pick up just one like, you know, you could make an argument like he really didn't think it was going to happen on the first stone. But then if you read further into Samuel, like the, the next uh, chapter, the next book, it talks about the relatives of Goliath. He had four relatives, four, I think four sons who were equally as big and nemesis like characters. Um, 
So then, you know, you start thinking, well, maybe, and there was a retaliation go, you know, that would happen in the, in the culture 2000 years ago. It was like the Hatfields and McCoys. You, you kill one of us, we're going to kill three of you. So he knew if he takes down this guy, he, they're probably going to have the four sons come after him. So he had five stones. But anyway, one of those characters is talked about in, in the, the, the next book, the second chapter of Samuel, I believe. First one's two Samuel. And he describes him as having six fingers and six toes on each hand and foot. So mm -hmm. he had a total of 24. So it's kind of, it is kind of a beastly thing, you know? It's interesting yeah. that, that the AI sometimes produces that. It does seem to have problems with hands and feet. Yeah, yeah. Even how um, in the symbolism of the numbers, uh, six is um, referenced as yeah. a number of imperfection. Mm -hmm. Seven, of course, mm -hmm. being the number of perfection. And of course, we know what three sixes equal. So it is, yeah, interesting connections yeah. there. Um, Father, what's what's going on with uh, gender ideology, transgenderism? Is, is it safe to say that this is something of demonic origin or how would you? I Yes, I say it all the time. Look, mm -hmm. what happened in Genesis 3, it's the same thing. Like the devil has no new tricks. It's the same thing. He just puts a different wrapping paper on it and a, a different bow. But they wanted to become like God. Eve was seduced into thinking she could become like God, take the fruit. Today, the fruit is we're going to be like gods and we're going to assign gender because that's a that's a God role. Only God assigns gender. So now man's trying to do it. But see, it's the same thing. We're trying to be God and the repercussions are going to be bad, horrible, because it's idolatry when you come right down to it. And if you go back and look at, you know, Baphomet has been an image of the devil that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. That thing has a goat head. It has a woman's torso with breasts and then a man's from the waist down a man. So the devil has already been showing himself to be in that game for hundreds of years, hundreds wow. yeah. way before we started thinking about it. Yeah. And that's sort of what it's, we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. You know, I've, um, I, I've been interested also in how, with that, there have been certain Catholic thinkers, uh, Robert George and Princeton, uh, Bishop Barron, who have emphasized how it's even with the transgenderism, it's a type of re-emergence of an ancient Gnostic heresy, because how Gnosticism perceived uh, the body or the corporal as something different or other or evil, but the spirit or the inner person as goods. So that how there's also this dualism that's being produced, which completely goes against the Christian understanding of the human person, holistic body, mind, and soul. And of course, corporal realities, the incarnation, the resurrection, the ascension, the assumption. So there's a lot going on there that does, as you say, tr is traced back to ancient, ancient times. This isn't just about uh, uh, 1960s feminist sexual revolution. I think, uh, as, as you're no, saying, there's no, a, no. And in fact, yeah, you know, it's odd to me, you, you just brought up the feminists, the feminists, are now no longer behind women. They're behind the transgender people. So the women are suffering. The women are losing the uh, awards. The women are losing the scholarships. The women are, are basically being pushed out as you're, we don't care about you anymore. It's all about these guys who race and, and compete against the women, but call themselves women. It's ridiculous. And you know, when it comes right down to it, when, when you, when God, it says, God, you know, he knit us in our mother's womb. He made us out of love for us. He brought us into creation to encounter us, to, to instill his spirit in us. And then to have someone turn around and go, no, I don't want this. This is what I want. It's, it's, it's so arrogant to think like we would just throw our fist up at God and say, I don't like what you created. I'm going to, I want yeah. something different. And it's so sad, really, because I know they're not thinking that with their, they're not doing it because they want to rage against God. They're just thinking, I, I, the devil has tricked them into thinking there's something better for you over here. This will mm -hmm. make you happy. And you know what happens for a lot of these people? They go down that road, they have operations, they take all these hormones, and then they wake up one day and go, this isn't making me happy. I'm still miserable. And now what do they do? You know, now there's some of them, they can't go back. So it's a terrible, terrible problem. I feel horrible for the people that uh, this lie has been lodged in their head that they're really not the person God made them to be. Mm. And I pray that they come into the fullness of the truth. 
and that they would they would embrace who God made them to be, and out of that, that's how they become a saint. Amen, amen. Because it's really acknowledging that there is the dignity, the human dignity that they pre- uh, possess that's bestowed by God Almighty. And it's funny because I think that, that in our culture, we would look down at something like a child wanting plastic surgery. But here, essentially, we're saying something similar. If uh, if the child or whomever it is is not happy with who they are or gender, and then presuming that at such a young age they can even make such decisions, it's it's become so ludicrous. It's it's uh, yeah yeah. It, it it defies reason. You know we that we've lost reason, and the intellect is not functioning properly, because if you can tell a kid they can't drive a car till they're sixteen, they can't smoke a cigarette till they're eighteen, they can't have a drink till they're twenty one, but if you can physically go under the knife and change your body as a kid. That doesn't make sense because kids go through phases all the time. I want to be a ballerina next week. I want to be an astronaut, you know, and in the next year I have a lot of little kids in my past that want to be priests, but you know, as they grow up, that, that changes from some of them, maybe not, but for others, then they want to be a fireman. Then they want to be a baseball player. Like yeah. let them be kids. There's no Amen. rush to making them adults. Amen. Amen. Father, uh, final question. Um, as an exorcist, what's um, in the ministry? What is um, perhaps the greatest um, source of wisdom that you've received from being an exorcist? The greatest source of wisdom? Hmm. Well, I think I'll put it to this. The best practices is stay humble, stay small, and and stay clean, you know? There's a, there's a lot of temptation that comes at you as a priest. And there's even more so, I think, as an exorcist, because the devil wants to throw you in the trash. Like it, the devil would want you dead. He wants everybody dead, but he really wants the exorcist dead. So you can't, you can't really be somebody who is thinking, you know, I don't do anything when I go into the exorcist. I pray the prayers. That's what I do. God does all of the work. So you, you can't get to a point where you're thinking this is me. And, you know, that takes a life of radical humility. You have to stay really. And I do. I tell people all the time. I really, you know, I, I'm obedient. I show up and I do the prayers and I and I pray for the people behind the scenes. And I have adoration every morning to feed my own soul. But this is God's work. You know, I just I'm the, the hands and the feet and the mouth. And he works. He does the work through through me. But it's not me. And I think that's important Amen. that people and people don't recognize that people think, no, I have to go to you because I saw somebody will call me from Canada. I have to come see you. I have, I think I have a team. I go, no, 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 There's exorcists in Canada. I'm pretty sure. Like you need to go to your diocese, but they, they get latched onto a personality and they think I have to see this one. It's, that's not the way it works. It's, it's all God. And then he's going to work through your local Bishop. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You know, you know, uh, as you're saying, Father, I I knew an exorcist who once said to me that essentially it's a healing ministry, and I think to myself, even in healing ministry, you know, whether it's charismatic or any type of healing ministry, it's it's done in the name of Jesus. It's mm-hmm. done through the power of Jesus Christ. The second that a person starts thinking that there's something special about them because they've received perhaps a charism of healing, that's when people can get in trouble. That's when things can go downhill. But that humility, where you know where the power comes from, you know who's in charge, um, that's that's what drives one uh, towards a safe place. Very important. And you know, I'll tell you something else. There's a lot of non-Catholic exorcists out there. And something I have found they all have in common is they charge. They charge a lot mm. of money to do an exorcism. And when, when I went to exorcism school in Rome, that's one of the first things they tell you, never take any payments for this ministry. It will diminish the power of the ministry and it will actually wind up hurting the person. So we never take any kind of money or anything from people. Uh, and people, you know, when, if you get delivered from a demon, you're pretty happy and you want to do something. You're like, please, Father, let me give you something. And I just say, you know, make a donation to Radio Maria or, or give to your local church. Um, but, you know, let's keep this separate. And maybe if, if I bump into you in a month or two, we can go have a, have a coffee somewhere. That's fine. But you know, I'm not really <laughs> not trying to make, become best friends with these, the, the, the people who've been subjects of this ministry. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's yeah, not, definitely. you got to treat it like this is, it's my, this is my job to do as, as the exorcist, but then 
you know, I, I leave there and, and I pray that they get well and I hand them back to their pastor because that's the person that's supposed to reintegrate them into the life of the church. And then I go on to the next, the next case. Yeah, amen. Because sometimes it's that uh, cult of personality that can also lead to a subtle idolatry. And yeah. it, it can happen very much around the priest. No question about that. Yeah. True. So, <laughs> yeah. Father Dan, thank you for your time. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for these words of wisdom. I appreciate it greatly. You're so welcome. God bless you. God bless you too. Thank you.